if you call yourself a responsible gun owner, then you should be able to prove it, right? Then you yeah, should be able to take the raging test. Then you should be able to take the legal tests that come with a license. And what we see... Go ahead and start the work session for the Waterloo City Council. Roll call, please. Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Morrissey. Holding down the left. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Always. <laughs> Mr. Shimp. Mrs. Klein. Here. Mr. Amos. Here. Mr. Schmidt. Here. Mrs. Juin. Here. Motion agenda is proposed. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, agenda is approved as presented. We're going to start out with the Red Cedar Initiative. So are you going to go? We'll do a handout. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then typical presentation, I'm not supposed to give you those till afterwards, right? Because <laughs> otherwise we're going to read along. Yeah. <laughs> And so those you can hold off on until about halfway through. Got a point to get through them. Introduce yourself. Okay. So I'm Danny Lovick. I'm the executive director for Red Cedar. Uh, we're a new regional partnership to really focus on commercialization of high growth uh, companies, startups, new technologies. Um, and I'll kind of get the full detail stuff, but kind of a regional partnership between the cities, the colleges, the universities, economic development to really look at that early stage portion of growth and startups in the region. Okay. So. Terrific. Uh, I wanted to say thanks, everyone, for having us present. I know we had a chance to talk with a lot of you. Margaret, I haven't had a chance to meet with you yet. But we had a chance to present to a lot of the city council, what would it have been now, eight, nine months ago, uh, back last year, just before the end. Um, and we presented as Millray Center. So obviously, we've changed the name, gotten all the branding figured out, and actually got going with everything for about six months now. And so really wanted to help give an update on what we've been working on. Because when we first pitched, it was really on, here's what we could be working on. So we've got about six months now of actually going, getting everything started. So we wanted to give an update and uh, make an ask of you guys. Great. So the first thing is I always want to start talking about why we're doing what we're doing and why we created Red Cedar in the first place. Um, so everyone always says small businesses are the job creators. So back about, uh, it was about 2013, MIT did a big research project. And they wanted to research, OK, for business growth, new job growth, where does a lot of that come from? Because a lot of times people say it's from small businesses, large businesses. So they actually wanted to research how much of net job creation actually comes from small versus large. What they found was it wasn't the size of the business that mattered. It was the age of the business. And they found that almost 100% of net job growth across the country comes from companies less than five years of age. And that's typically because companies that are more established, that are growing, typically they're automating, improving their processes. So I use the example of Deere. They've vastly grown their output and their production in the last 30 years, but their workforce hasn't grown a lot. So it's a lot of times these new companies, the early stage companies that are creating new products, that are getting into new ways to utilize labor, because a lot of times they're addressing technologies or areas that haven't been done before. So they're not automated. There isn't an easy system that they can just plug into and do. And what we realized through the last couple of years of really working in this and then through partnership with community leaders in the area is a lot of our traditional resources were kind of geared toward the existing companies and the expansion side. And when I say startups, the reason I wanted to throw up the word startups innovation is a lot of times those are buzzwords. Um, they get thrown out all the time. Everyone loves to talk about innovation. So what we're really talking about here is those early stage companies, typically less than five years of age, that have a high growth model. Um, it's a new technology, a new product that has to get commercialized that we've been talking about and kind of driving some of our resources around. Great. So the problem is that we're a little bit behind. 
Um, so even just comparing against some of the state communities, um, from Iowa City, Ames, Cedar Rapids, Des Moines, um, about three years behind Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, just in terms of some of the programming they've been doing. Um, some of the new BOCO initiatives, they got a few seed funds in the area, an accelerator program. Ames, about five years with a lot of the things that they have through SciStar, there's a lot of their ag tech industry that they've been building off of. Des Moines, about 11 years. Um, and they actually, beginning of this year, put out a blog post talking about you know, a reflection on the last 11 years, about how 11 years ago when they were talking about terms like startups, um, early stage companies, seed capital, no one in Des Moines knew what they were talking about. It was a new concept. And over the last 11 years, people have started to understand beyond just the buzzwords of them what they mean. What they mean is really the early stage companies, entrepreneurs building new products and taking new commercial or new technologies and commercializing them in the region. So really it's a lot of the growth happening from companies, from entrepreneurs. Um, you see them not just from you know, university R&D, you see it from existing tech companies and um, from existing companies that have spinoffs. Because a lot of times people think entrepreneurs are the college student sitting in a room somewhere coming up with something. Most people we've been working with that we've talked to are usually mid 30s to early 40s, kind of gotten through the stage of starting their family. They've gotten some institutional knowledge working somewhere and they see an opportunity that then they realize, well, no one else is addressing this. So what if I created something new to actually capitalize on it? Plus then we do get a lot of the deal flow coming from colleges, students that are going through the UNI student incubator programs through Wartburg's new programs. But then we always realize we need to find a way to help them connect to the next piece and the continual moving on. And it's just like, I'll get that next slide. It's like any company, you have to create repeatable processes. So how do we help entrepreneurs who are building companies see a path for how they continue to build that here? And even though I say it's a problem, we have an incredible amount of resources here. Just from looking at this list, and I kind of intentionally made it convoluted, just threw everything up there. Because when we started all this, even just three, four years ago, and it's been going on longer than that, that's just when we started the formal conversations, we realized we have a lot of resources between the universities, the college, economic development, uh, you have physical places like TechWorks, the Makerspace, Millrace, ID8. There's a lot of these places where people are culminating around and the university research coming out of the colleges. But to most people trying to build a company or start something new, this is how they see it. They just see a bunch of resources. They don't know what events they should go to. They don't know who they should talk to, when they should plug into which resource at what time. So one of the biggest things we realized was, like I said, just like any company, to scale, you have to build repeatable processes. You have to be able to take what you just spent the last six months working on manually researching and figure out how do we do this again and again without spending six months doing it. So just like that as a community, we needed to figure out, okay, for people building companies, it can't be a new process for every entrepreneur every time. We have to find a way to help them figure out, okay, at this stage, you should be talking to this person. Let's get you enrolled in this program. Um, if they're a company that's at an early stage that can really scale, how do we get you in touch with some investors in the area to look at seed capital for your company? Especially those companies that don't have a lot of physical assets that are too early on for a bank loan. How do we help connect them with the investors who you're usually willing to take a little more risk to help them get their company ready to get to the bank investment? So kind of the way we've always described what we're working on, a lot of times people have heard the term startup accelerators, venture capital fund. So more than just a startup accelerator, venture capital fund, Red Cedar is an innovation catalyst. We're a venture development organization focused on accelerating the commercialization of new technologies and high growth startups across the Cedar Valley. But really more than that, and I know when we pitched uh, back earlier last year, we talked about the big regional piece. So over the last six months, what we really defined was our role within that regional piece. But more than that, we are part of and bringing together a regional network of organizations, all who realize that same common need, that we have a lot of resources, but we're not doing an effective job of helping entrepreneurs move through it and getting them connected with the right pieces at the right time. So in your handouts that I did give you, um, that is really, you'll see these 15 components up here. What we're doing over the next six to eight months or so is really bringing together this regional network to define what are our deficiencies as a community, what are our capacities, and then with these 15 components and then that handout, we included how to identify those capacities, what metrics are behind them, an overview of them. But looking at as a region, how are we sitting down and looking at over the next 10 to 15 years, how are we actually addressing a lot of the capacities on this map? Because when you see all the partners that we've talked about up there, this type of initiative is too big for any one of us to address. Even when we started Red Cedar, we kind of said we need to build the ecosystem, which when we pitched that the first time sounds very vague and doesn't really mean a whole lot. So what we've found over the last six months as we've gotten going, there's components out there that Red Cedar has really fit into. The risk capital piece, the networking opportunities, a lot of the buzz, innovative culture, a lot of those pieces that bring together some of the players in the community. 
as well as some of the business acumen, entrepreneurial capacity pieces. But there's pieces on there that we do nothing with that we have to lean on partners like you and I, Wartburg, Hawkeye. Um, and the government policies piece, that's a big reason why we're here today. And that government policies piece in that document really explains what we mean when we say that. It's not just saying we need to build our business climate. It's really identifying specific ways that we as a region can work on identifying some of these capacities and improving them. So it's kind of a continual improvement process. If we're not measuring it, it doesn't get done. So how do we as a region start to look at these capacities and figure out how we're improving them year over year? So quickly, because I know we've gotten in the habit of the last six months, of we've read see there's a name out there, it's a new thing, but really that partnership, that network is the bigger important piece. So I want to give a chance for some of the partners to actually get up here and talk about why they're partnered on this. Uh, so first, if I could, Chris Hansen, he's CEO of Western Home Communities. I can let him introduce himself. Uh, but he's one of the board members for Red Cedar and has really been one of the private partners who have helped drive this from the start. Thanks, Danny. Hello, Council. How are you today? Okay. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, I tell you, the main reason that we, uh, we went into it is, uh, as Danny described, with all the innovation that's going on, one of our core values at Western Home Communities is, is innovation. And uh, I think the bigger thing is, even though we're talking about economic development, I think we're also talking about talent development uh, with Red Cedar. And for those young entrepreneurs to uh, get the experience of trying to put a project together or a model together, an idea together and then actually build a model that creates some business acumen and it also keeps a lot of talent uh, in the community that if we don't have something like that, they're gonna go to some other Cedar Rapids, Des Moines, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it was two or threefold actually. One was definitely the talent and the business acumen that's gonna be created right here in our own space. I think the networking, um, of the entrepreneurial uh, group around the community. Um, but also, again, innovation being a component of what we're about, is there some opportunity for some intergenerational uh, activities there? We've got some pretty good, sharp, retired uh, ex-John Deere engineers or academia or farming. The farmers actually know how to build this stuff with their hands. They don't have to do it all on a computer. As an old farm boy, I'm just. Uh, but anyway, just those those different kinds of uh, opportunities that now gets created and and the interaction um, between that space and and the co-working, but they might very well uh, come up with some idea that we can kick out from a gap that we've identified um, in the aging services perspective that gives them a goal to shoot out or to shoot at and to, and to build a company around. So um, we're, we're pretty excited. I, I think probably the main way that we got involved was back when Danny was putting the group together, we had the old chamber building over there in Cedar Falls off of First Street. And so we worked with them at a, in a pretty good way to give them a, a place to start and a genesis to, to get things going there and then uh, we've just seen the value and, and carried on with it. So Great. any questions for, for me? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Kinghorn. I direct the Center for Business Growth and Innovation at the University of Northern Iowa. And uh, we're excited for the partnership that we have with Red Cedar and, uh, and what the promise is to deliver to the community, the greater community. Obviously, uh, Waterloo stands to gain a great deal with this partnership. Um, we've actively been involved in your community through the years. Um, the 4th Street project is one that we were heavily involved with. Uh, we currently continue to work with the business community over here. Uh, we take a little bit broader approach. Obviously, those that are involved in innovation and, and the creative space uh, is a vital component to our communities, but we also recognize that a number of businesses, no matter how big or small they are, serve to provide the, va the value and the benefit to the whole community. And so our programs are aimed and geared towards helping and assisting these entrepreneurs <coughs> who frequently uh, have challenges and struggles just because we drive by their buildings and uh, we recognize the brands, the names, the, the the businesses are doesn't mean that they necessarily are run effectively and efficiently and so we seek to uh, provide whatever support we can working with uh, partners like that of the of the red cedar program allows us to better leverage 
the resources we have to be able to uh, really hone in on those that could benefit from, who they are, identify them, and then uh, collectively provide those services. Depending on who the partner is that best suited and has the resources and the skills and the talents to be able to do that. And so to that extent, we're excited for this partnership. We know we've got a lot of potential in the Waterloo market that isn't necessarily being tapped. We've got programs that we're bringing to this area that will help target the minority, the uh, less um, traditional entrepreneurial community, those that nonetheless still would benefit from the benefit of, of uh, business and and uh, what that brings to them individually as owners, but also to the communities, those that they would hire. So appreciate your time letting us come here uh, and uh, whatever support, tacit or otherwise, you can provide to the project. Uh, we would love to see that. Thank Great. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, Council. Carrie Darrow with the Alliance and Chamber. Um, first of all, I think the two takeaways that I heard loud and clear was number one, we are way behind. And number two, this is a regional concept, and I think that's the exciting part because it has to be regional for us to create this ecosystem that welcomes this kind of innovation. We can't just have little pockets here and there. We have to be known as the part of the state where innovators and inventors and connectors can go. So we're really, really excited to support the Red Cedar Project. And if you're wondering why, why the Alliance and Chamber isn't leading this, we're a partner, and we love being a partner with Red Cedar. This is a feeder to our continuum. We work with early stage and already established companies. That's what our business model has been all along. We've never been an organization that really dug down into the innovation and the entrepreneurship, but we support it 110%. So our request of you is to, we'd like you to be at the table too. We think it's important that our largest uh, community be a part of what's going on here. And again, I think what's really exciting is that this is regional and you'll see some really, um, really awesome outcome from what's going on at Red Cedar. I'm sure there are questions, but I think Danny has a little more to share with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alice. So the, from the beginning, this really has been a public-private partnership, and that's partly why I wanted to bring everyone up, is I can get up here and talk all day, um, but at the same time, most of the work isn't being done by me. A lot of times I consider myself just a glorified secretary for everyone over here. It seems like I schedule a lot of meetings and pull a lot of people together. Um, but from the beginning, Red Cedar itself was really driven by entrepreneurs. It was just in conversations. Um, Trey Steffen, who uh, was one of the company's uh, leaders who helped co-found it, he's on the board now, he's the board president. He had a company who was taking through an accelerator down in Iowa City, or Cedar Rapids. And he was there, that's where I originally met him, uh, found out he was from Cedar Falls. So when he got back here, we connected and just realized when he was down there, he was surrounded by an environment of support, connections, resources, all of who were saying, what can we help you with? Who can we get you connected with? When you're at this point, you know, we know some of these people that we can get you in touch with. If you're looking for investment, here's a group we can get you in touch with. And then when he came back here, he kind of felt isolated. He felt like he didn't have that same environment. He didn't have those connections. He didn't have a place where he could plug into in a community that really said, here's the process. Here's how we can get you involved. What do you need? And then so we just got to talking about it. Like, OK, well, let's start. Let's get some people together. So we did. And from that, though, you know, that's where conversations with the Western Home came up. We've talked with Randy Pilkington and Paul since for the last three years on all of this, really defining what are some of the needs. We're all kind of dabbling and working in innovation. You and I especially has been doing a lot through the incubator programs, uh, the student incubator, venture schools, some of the programs they've run there. But we realized we need to get more than just you know, a single isolated community involved. We need to get investors involved, private business leaders who have been through the process of building a company, who can act as mentors, who can support. And then when you look at that asset map, the components, how do we address things in here like government policies, um, community mindset, things that we can't change individually. Those are always going to be collaborative issues that can take years to solve, but how do we at least drive a conversation forward? And like I said earlier, what gets measured gets done. How do we actually start measuring this so we figure out how are we going to be able to say in 10 years from now, that we are better at helping people build their companies in this region now than we were 10 years ago. So we realized we can't do that ourselves, so we genuinely want to bring together a public-private partnership. So Red Cedar is a 501c3 nonprofit pending. Government takes a little bit of time to get back on that, but pending for that. And we realized, though, to do that, thankfully I have been studying some economics in school and college, and uh, did my, some of my research on um, social impact bonds, a lot of the public-private partnership issues there. We knew from the beginning, if we're going to do this, we want the buy-in and the leadership and the advice and mentorship of people that built companies, the private business leaders, 
But if we're going to ask any support from public institutions, from the cities, we have to be very accountable with it. Because we always said from the beginning, the relationships are more important than the resources. So the structure of Red Cedar, there is both a board of directors and a governance committee. So the board of directors is your standard board of directors. It's all private business leaders, community leaders. Uh, so Chris Hansen with the Western Home, uh, Nick Evans with Viridian, uh, Mark Kitchell with Eagle View Partners, Therese Stevens with Braceability, and the formatting on this is a little, little bit off, but Trey Steffen with Howe Factory, uh, Laura Hand with VGM is here today. And then we actually have an open board position, if anyone's interested. <laughs> Um, but the key point of this group was we really said to them as business leaders, we don't just want you to show up, you know, once a month and give your input. Like we need, you are the ones that have built companies. You're the one that have been through this. Um, what did you go through? What do we need to be doing? What should we be focusing on? So they have each made a commitment to be hands-on to helping drive this. Um, the seed fund that we do, Nick Evans, his background at Viridian is all of their seed stage equity investments. They're invested in 40 some companies around the state. Um, with the average jobs of those companies paying over $70,000 a year. He's the one that knows seed funding. I, when I came into this, knew almost nothing about it. But when we got this group together, they said early stage access capital is one of the most important things we don't have. So I said, okay, what do we need to do? And then again, I became the glorified secretary and I just had to do whatever they ended up saying we had to do. But this group was really the one that had the expertise that needed to drive this forward. But then from the public side, we realized if we're going to ask for any public funding, we have to be incredibly accountable with it because the only way we find sustainability with any of this, as long as we know what everyone's expecting, shared outcomes, and that in the end of the time, we've actually addressed them. So the governance committee is made up of those public founding sponsors who have really helped to support this financially and hands-on helping to scale it. So the University of Northern Iowa, City of Cedar Falls, Cedar Falls Utilities, the Alliance and Chamber, uh, Wartburg College and Hawkeye Community College have all signed on the three years of really hands-on buy-in to help support this, both financially and actually being involved. And I meet with everyone here probably more than they want me to, but we meet constantly to figure out, okay, how are we getting this done? And there's an art form to trying to get that group together. <laughs> but it's one of those things that we realize we just need to have more ongoing regular conversations around this. So they provide oversight for the plan of work. Um, currently, at this point, these last six months, we've been meeting every other month, providing an update on everything we've been doing. Uh, the group reviewed the financials. Um, and then as well, the governance committee has one board ex officio position on the board to make sure there's a connection there between the two. And when we were first doing this all, pitching later last year, we realized it's a lot to ask for three years of support when in three years you can't even project what's going to happen in the next six months, especially with something new. So we knew we had to at least say, here's what we are going to accomplish in the first year. So the first was establish and fund an early stage seed capital fund then the Cedar Valley. And that was really because we realized we are one of the largest communities in Iowa that doesn't have a formalized way for early stage companies and entrepreneurs to get in touch with investors and get seeds funding for their company. So I can say as of this point, we just launched the seed fund, is it two months ago now? Uh, we currently have made one approved investment in a company out of Wartburg, um, just, just graduated from Wartburg a couple of years ago. And just to show how that network works, it was actually from the SBDC at UNI that he had contacted them looking for financing to get his company going because it was too early on for the banks. It's a manufactured recreational product. Um, he's been through an accelerator program at Harvard, at Yale. Um, they've actually done 19 test units overseas of the product. And that was originally what drove the product was he saw a need, he's from Ghana. Uh, saw a need in Ghana for a way to reduce the particulate matter out of burning materials. His grandmother died from it, but then found a recreational use for it. It generates electricity by burning whatever consumable material. And he found a way to commercialize it in the recreational industry in the U.S. with the goal of eventually getting into the international markets to address the social good issue side of it. But it came to us through the SBDC. Um, that was the first time we had just gotten the seed fund launched. And it's a group of nine private investors, all putting $30,000 per year in for three years. Uh, 20,000 of that oops, is investable into the fund. The other 10,000, 7,500 is actually a tax deductible donation to Red Cedar as a nonprofit. So we had to make an argument to private investors that's worth almost a third of their investment just to go to supporting a nonprofit. And the selling point really was, we don't have deal flow and a structure to really help support these companies as they're growing. So we need to build that. So we've launched the fund. Uh, we're approving that investment this week. We're actually meeting with the company and the law firm to go over the, the arrangement for it. It's early stage seed capital. It's just a convertible note. So it's a loan that then says, if you go and raise actual series of funding, it converts to equity at that point. So it's really a group of nine investors with really good connections, background, advice that they can work with that company, but then also get them some early capital to get started. And he has talked to some of the banks, uh, tried to get loans, but he was just too early on. They don't have capital to back it up. 
So they weren't able to get it from that. And we've actually worked with the banks on this one uh, to try and get them in touch with them. They said, no, we can't quite do it yet. So then we got them in touch with the seed fund to take a look at it there. The second was to establish a regional innovation network, the big reason we're here today, in coordination with the existing public and private partners, focused specifically on looking at those capacities as a region and how are we over the next 10 to 15 years collaboratively figuring out how we measure these and improve on them. Um, so the big piece of that is, and I'll get to that number four, is though that a lot of this work isn't being done by us, me, at Red Cedar. It's being done as a region, but part of the work that we're doing is helping to coordinate this process because we've spent the last several years digging in, figuring out what are some of the needs, researching some of the ways we can actually measurably do this. So the third Danny, was- let me interrupt if yeah. I may, because I know you're so passionate about this. You could probably talk about this for another couple hours. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, and I really encourage you to maybe come back another time where we can have more time or, um, and I'm really impressed with the leadership groups you've, you've brought together. You've done an incredible job. But can I ask just one time, see if there's questions from the council, and then maybe you could tell us as a wrap up what you need from us. How's that sound? Good. Okay. Questions? I'm good. When can, when can you come back to finish? Yeah. So, and honestly, that's, should I just jump to the ask? Because it, it answers that question. But, yeah, okay. So, originally. Oh, oh, oh Dan, yeah. can I finish? Uh, because I would like you to go through the. I want more. The um, yeah. handouts. Yeah. Because yeah. there's, uh, I had several questions in reading that, that that I wanted to ask. And I know if you just go to the ask, we're not going to get to the other stuff in here. So, I sure would, if it's possible, yeah. uh, to uh, have a another work session on it, Dan. I really would love to sit down. I, we'd, we'd enjoy that. Um, and because the ask is actually, we were planning to originally come and ask for funding. It was actually just a week ago. And you know when something's not quite right and you don't know what it is, but it's like when your car is misfiring on one cylinder, it still runs, but there's something wrong. Kind of had that feeling. And after talking with, um, with Randy, with Carrie, some of the group, we realized we started this always saying the relationships are more important than the resources. And we felt we hadn't done a good enough job of establishing that relationship with the council yet, really explaining what we're working on. So the ask today is that we all we're asking for is a written endorsement and partnership so that we can get started working as a part of that regional network, get Waterloo to the table, and get started with developing that. But then the opportunity to pitch it or come to this fall's budget presentations and actually make a formal request for funding at that point for the fiscal year end 2020 budget. Because you mentioned that Cedar Falls and CFU are part of your organization are you asking for that same level of involvement at least from waterloo yep so we're asking for the same level of involvement from when we make the financial ask the same level of involvement from waterloo that we did from cedar falls which is thirty three thousand dollars per year for three years okay great and so i would really like the opportunity we would to actually sit down with you guys talk what this looks like because it is a big enough thing that there's enough moving pieces it's hard to say in 15 minutes what that looks like but we'd like the opportunity to have that discussion yeah. Yeah, and then just a just a note too. So a written endorsement from the council, we would if that's what the if the council wants to move forward with this, we'd probably just do a resolution of support and put that on the agenda for approval. Okay. Well, and can we, if we want to arrange another work session, are you talking about not doing it until you come with the financial ask at the same time? Any time between now and then, we'd be more than glad to sit down and talk with you. Okay. Can he contact you, Kelly, to get on a work session? Mm -hmm. Okay. And schedule a meeting? Yeah. Well, I should call the city clerk and she'll get you on the schedule. Could you and handle? you'll also draft a resolution for us. Is that correct? If that's what the council would like, you bet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Whatever we say. Could you schedule it for at least a half hour, Kelly? Yeah. Sure. So stay tuned. Let's do, we got the first half, and again, I appreciate all of you coming. It shows great support for this program. And Danny, you're a lot more than clerical. Your energy behind this has really <laughs> driven this a long ways, and I think everybody in the audience would agree with that. So thank you very much. We will um, talk about, do you want to talk now about a resolution of support, or do you want to do that at a later time? Do that later, later. So we've got two more work sessions yeah. here before yeah. finance. Yeah. yeah. Be fair to the other folks. We're going to address the resolution of support at a later date when we've got a little more time. Um, and you get in touch with our city clerk, and we'll see you again. And congratulations again. You've pulled together a great group of people and organizations. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Okay, next on the agenda is our fire chief talking about using Iowa Income Offset Program for ambulance building, billing. Okay, Pat Treeler, uh, Fire Chief, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick introductory uh, it, to the idea of what we're going to present uh, this afternoon, and I'll let uh, Clerk Felkley uh, take over and talk about the program a little bit more and go over the PowerPoint with you. Uh, but recently I attended a, a workshop uh, at a conference that focused on increasing revenue recovery uh, from ambulance billings. The workshop uh, explained how the Iowa Department of Administrative Services, or DAS, income offset program could increase collections on outstanding or unpaid ambulance bills. After the workshop, I talked to uh, Clerk Felkley and Deputy Clerk Evan regarding the income offset program. They were both very aware of the income offset program and had worked with the program in other communities that they'd worked at uh, with good results. So we met numerous times to discuss uh, the issue, including we had Dave Zellifer at the meetings, and we've collectively have agreed that we feel that it's a program that we should enter into that could potentially not only help Waterloo Fire in collecting on unpaid or outstanding ambulance bills, but maybe other areas of the city. To be clear, we're not looking to change the way we bill for our current services. We would still continue to use our third-party billing. We wouldn't change any of our internal processes of how we bill a patient. This would be one tool that we would add to our ability to collect on unpaid bills. And I'll be here to answer questions. I also have uh, medical supervisor Hernandez with me as well. I'll turn it over to Kelly and she can go into a little bit of what the income offset program's actually all about. Do you mind being my Vanna White and flipping through the slides? Sure. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you to Leanne Even. She did a lot of research and calling around to other cities to kind of see how the larger cities are using that in their community, so thank you for doing that. Um, so the income offset program is um, administrated, as Pat said, by the Department of Administrative Services, or DAS, Next slide. Um, how the program works is DAS recovers delinquent payments owed to the state and local governments, and they do this by withholding money from various sources um, to individuals and vendors. Next slide. There's a section in Iowa Code that allows for this to happen. That's section 8A.504, in case anybody's interested in that. I won't go into the that too much. You can, next slide. Um, the sources of program funds that they use um, to get the revenues back to municipalities and um, state agencies that are owed money is it's your casino winnings, your lottery winnings, and then income tax refunds. It's where we um, you'll see most of the revenue coming back from. Um, how it works is debt is identified by matching social security numbers or TIN numbers, um, and anytime there's a hit with those numbers, um, then the city gets notified that there's um, potential revenue that can be collected to um, take care of that debt. The only thing that they do require is that the minimum debt not be less than $50. So in order to collect these funds, the city does have some responsibilities. First of all, we have to send the information over to DAS, and we have to first make a good faith effort to collect the funds. So in the um, instance of ambulance billing, TriTech is notifying patients that they have outstanding bills due. So that's covering our good faith effort to collect the funds. And then we upload the information to DAS's um, page. And when they have a notification that there's somebody to be receiving, um, say an income tax refund, they notify this the city. And so we have to let the debtor know that they have 10 days um, to either pay the bill, um, appeal the bill, or um, allow their um, income tax refund to be garnished. Um, some of the bullet points I've got up there, um, it includes, we have to send out a letter basically with our contact information, the number of days they have to respond, 
what the appeal process looks like, um, the fact that they have a right to appeal, and the fact that there's a debt owed to the city and the city ha does have a right to collect those funds. So it's a little bit complicated, so we kind of thought it would be good to have a scenario to kind of make it make a little bit more sense. So in this scenario, Sally takes an ambulance ride and receives a $723.79 bill, but chooses not to pay. She gets three notifications um, at 30-day intervals from TriTech, which is the billing company that the fire department utilizes to collect the outstanding bill. Um, once the bill has um, been designated as being definitely outstanding, then we would submit the information to DAS through their automated file submission process. Um, in this scenario, she's going to get a $800 state income tax refund. DAS holds that refund payment and notifies our office that this money is potentially coming to her. And then she has, we get a fair notice that she has 10 days to pay or have her income tax be withheld or appeal the bill. There is a cost to doing this. It's a $7 administrative fee, but we can pass the administrative fee on to the person who has the outstanding debt. Again, um, participating agencies. Um, there's quite a few agencies that participate in this program. There's 61 state agencies, three universities, the IRS, all 99 county clerks of court, 13 counties, 225 cities, 13 community colleges, 59 municipal utilities and 13 housing authorities are already participating in this program. And why we want to participate is, um, and Pat can go into this a little bit more too, um, the fee for participation is $7 versus 30 to 50% of the outstanding debt that's being taken by the collection agency. It does not impact the debtor's credit score or lead to wage garnishments. Um, we've had program success um, with other communities. When I worked in Evansdale, we, util we utilized this program. Leanne, when she worked in Jessup, utilized this, and um, several other, other larger municipalities are using it as well, and it has the potential to increase fire department revenue. Steps for implementation would be the council has to enter into a memorandum of understanding with DAS in order to, excuse me, to participate in the program. We have to establish an appeals procedure, um, and there's several other cities that have already set up an appeals procedure. They put it on their city website, so it's very easy for um, people to find. Um, we would need to adopt a red flag policy for identifying and protecting against fraud, and this is. It's not a requirement, but it's a best practice. Since we are taking credit card payments and things like that in the city already, we do need to have a policy like this on file. That's it. Do you have anything else to add, Pat? No, I mean, I'd be uh, open to any questions that council may have or <clears throat> something we didn't explain. Uh, we do feel that uh, this can only increase revenue. There's no chance of decreasing uh, any type of revenue. So keep in mind, we're not talking about changing the way we bill. It's just adding one extra tool to collect on unpaid ambulance bills. Mr. Amos. Um, my question was, is from a delinquency standpoint, how many actual, I guess the dollar amount would be, do you have a figure as far as right now, the amount of individuals that are delinquent with actual ambulance bills? Well, we wouldn't have a total number as in uh, the exact bills. We can tell you that uh, the last uh, few years, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but somewhere in the area of uh, 500 to 700 bills uh, in a year or in some sort of uh, unpayment status. Wow. And and we run, we run about 9,000 calls a year and we transport somewhere right around 7,000 billable so calls. Other questions? Those are rounded a little bit. Okay. Um, you said it would increase revenue for the fire department. <clears throat> would that reduce the ask at budget time from the fire department? Well, it could potential. I mean, uh, we're, we don't know how much this will increase revenue. We have, we have no clue. Um, 
I would think that some of these people that are in collections or in default right now, at some point in time would have a state tax return coming back to them or potentially a lottery winning. I've talked to a, a chief in Iowa that uh, went to this program and they saw a, a large increase in their revenue. Now, I can't quantify what large is, uh, but they did see an increase in uh, collection and the collection rate. So I think any income that comes into the fire department budget could certainly um, help our ask at budget time for sure. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr. Schmidt. So I think you may have answered this, but so right now we don't really have a good guess on amount of money. You're thinking hundreds of, of bills, but we don't know if we're talking $10,000 or $100,000 or anything like that. Uh, potential increased stage. revenue? Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we wouldn't have a we wouldn't have a guess on that. What I'm telling you for sure is that we're not gonna decrease our revenue by sure. going to this type of system to add on to the steps that we already have in place. And I seem to remember at budget time that you have made the case on several occasions that there is a pretty significant number out there that we don't collect. So this would potentially have an impact on that. Correct. Yeah. And Chief, this this is something different than what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, right? Because I thought we were talking about something where insurance. your auto insurance and we're going to bill them. That and this are two different conversations. Yeah, hundred percent. They're okay. totally right. different. And later tonight on the council agenda is the Fire Recovery USA resolution and potential ordinance. So that yes, that has nothing to do uh, with that. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yes. Morrissey. Uh, um, <clears throat> Chief Trelor, you said five to seven hundred bills, uh, sort of on average, go unpaid. They're on payment status. What's a ballpark average for that amount? Is there any ballpark number that you can look at? But per per, is there an average? I mean, can you? So you're talking average bill? Yeah. Oh, okay. Somewhere in the range of the $500 range. And Somewhere in there, depending on the severity of the call. So if you multiplied that by five to 700, that would be quite a bit of money, even though you have to percentage out a certain amount to go to the collector, correct? Correct. Okay. And who are the ones, who are the people that are primarily affected by that, by this, that are, where they're going unpaid or are, are they people that were without insurance or what? Yeah, I'd say that's the vast majority would be people that, that have no insurance. We certainly have a number of uh, clients in the city that call multiple times per month uh, that don't have insurance and really have no intention of paying the bill. So there's certainly some of those. And then there are people that, uh, that don't have insurance, that do make a conscious effort to make payments, and they come in uh, weekly and monthly to do that. And we work with those people. We don't send those types of people to collection, and we wouldn't send those types of people to this program either if they're making a good faith effort to make payments on the bill. We're extremely fair that way. And, and if you get repeat calls, I expect that uh, some of those people would be in the dependent adult class that um, that are chronic repeaters uh, require an ambulance care. I would suspect some of them. Sure, I, I, I think that's accurate. And Medical Supervisor Hernandez, along with our Medical Director Chris Hill, have been working with the program uh, along the lines of community paramedicine to work with our uh, people that call frequently to see if we can get them services other than calling the 911 service to access medical care. And that's basically what they're doing. They may not have a, a ride or transportation or money to get to the hospital. They may not have a, a, a primary physician. Their access to health care is through the emergency service. And I, I know you've heard that before, but uh, uh, that's what we're seeing a lot of these, these bills that go unpaid are those types of uh, clients that we serve. Have you seen any um, change, any rise in the unpaid, unpayment uh, numbers since this privatization of uh, Medicaid services in the state of Iowa? Have you seen any increase? 
I, I will say that at the beginning, I, I, I did think we, we did see a little bit of an uptick. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, in the last six to eight months, I would say no. I would say that uh, we haven't seen an increase of unpaid. Okay, so that first came off the very top when it first started, the changeover. Correct, yeah. Okay. And one, one final question was um, it, it talked about sources of program funds and uh, the scenario was income tax refund i believe mm -hmm. and wh what about the other ones like casino winnings and lottery winnings um vendor payments for goods and services how what kind of i mean how is it collected through those different sources um that I'm not 100% sure on because a lot of times when we when I worked in Evansdale when we would get payments back it was through an income tax refund because they'll let you know what source of funds it's coming from. So if a lottery winning yes. is a lottery winning is large enough you need to give your social security number to be able to be paid that. Mm -hmm. So once that social security number is registered then it would it would ping and say there's other there's other entities owed uh, so that would be subtracted off their their winnings and chief Treeler, this would all be handled by das though right i mean they would access the funds on our behalf right well it's just like the presentation they would give notification to the individual that if i had an outstanding uh speeding ticket from cedar rapids for example they would contact me and say you're not going to get your state tax return until you pay cedar rapids uh, that amount of money for that speeding ticket. And that's, would they go after the lottery money, for example, as well? Oh, 100%, yeah. yes. So they would still handle um, retrieving those funds. That's correct. And yeah. you mentioned ambulance, but you also just mentioned speeding tickets. Right now, we're just talking about ambulance. 100%. Right? For what we're talking about, yes. Right. I gave that example because we've had yeah. a few of our, our members got a letter, got a notification of an unpaid uh, speeding ticket in Cedar Rapids. So Cedar Rapids is using this program to collect on speeding tickets. There's other communities that very close to us that use the collection for other things other than ambulance billing. What we're here before you today is to say, we want to enter into this agreement for ambulance, ambulance billing. And once again, mm -hmm. we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask one final quick question. Are you still gonna use the, the credit um, reporting system as well for other collections because it sounds like DES has got limited sources for retrieval. Um, perhaps a collection agency might have some other additional ones. Correct. So we're still going to utilize the collection uh, but, service. Okay. And what we intend on doing is uh, when they've done their skip tracing, when they've worked the file where they're saying, okay, we've come up with nothing, we're no longer working this, then we'll enter it in the clerk's office in conjunction with fire, we enter it into the DAS system and then that's where it would sit as opposed to sitting at a collection agency that has no intention on working it going forward. Why wouldn't we go DAS first since their fee is so much lower? Well, the DAS is just gonna it's just gonna sit there and if there's no tax if there's no tax return coming, we're not gonna get a dime. Okay. So we don't wanna we don't wanna uh, negatively affect anything here. We think the safe bet to go is is what we're using with collections, shorten the period of time we give them to work the collection, and then put it to the DAS program. Okay. Thank you. We're out of questions, so we can. So thank you very much, Chief. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Anderson, are you going to address the alcohol sales use overlay district? Oh, Eric, Mr. Schrader is going to. Eric Schrader, city planner. So we're proposing to do an amendment to the zoning ordinance that will affect the uh, alcohol sales restrictions. It'll essentially address two components. Uh, one is there's currently alcohol sales overlay districts uh, over several uh, neighborhoods within the city of Waterloo. This proposed amendment would expand the the uh, over uh, alcohol sales overlay district in the Church Row neighborhood. So included in the packet of materials um, that were provided includes a map of both the existing Church Row 
uh, overlay district and the proposed expansion of the overlay district, as well as a legal description of, of um, the overlay district. Uh, the overlay district provides for multiple restrictions on what alcohol sales uses uh, can go in there. Uh, one of which is a restriction on uh, establishments that, um, uh, with an exception for grocery stores, which is currently uh, capped, at your, you meet the definition of a grocery store if you're 10,000 square feet or larger. So the second uh, amendment as part of this proposed uh, zoning ordinance amendment is to increase the square footage requirement from 10,000 square feet to 15,000 square feet to meet that exception of where you're considered a grocery store and the increased alcohol sales restrictions would therefore apply to you. So those are the limits of the proposed amendment. It's pretty simple, um, but yet it's kind of a, uh, a big change. So we wanted to make sure we had a work session first. Uh, I'll entertain questions, but it is proposed on uh, tonight's council agenda to set a date of hearing for a couple weeks out. Any questions on it? Questions? Yes. I do. Ms. Does Klein. this hit um, Sullivan and Third Street corner of? I don't think it does. Sullivan and Third should already be in. I've got a map here. If it's already in, then should that liquor store slash grocery store that we discussed last time come up again we'd have to close first right for like 30 days yeah and then yeah any existing establishment um, that is in an overlay district uh, it becomes grandfathered in if it ceases for more than 90 days then it would um, lose its non-conforming status and then henceforward, any future establishment would have to adhere to the, the new requirements. Okay. Mr. Shader, what happens with the facility on Byron? Because we just approved beer and wine and not liquor. So if this is passed in, how does this happen? Yeah, they the, would be grandfathered in they, just as wine and beer? No, they'll, um, they had a complete application submitted. I mean, this isn't even adopted yet, but assuming yeah. this gets uh, adopted here within the next few weeks on its hearing point, they will have had a completed application uh, prior to adoption of the ordinance. It would be grandfathered in, including it's my understanding that they're appealing the hard liquor. If they win that appeal, they will be grandfathered in for that. So it will really. If they don't win it, it would not be grandfathered in. Correct. Okay. Okay. Other Chairman? questions? Yeah. Chairperson? Yeah. Uh, why increase at 5,000 square feet, Eric? It was um, the. Intent of the overlay district is to uh, try and restrict the alcohol sales, but there was a concern that we didn't want to um, discourage the development of grocery stores, so we created an exception for a grocery store. What, how you define that, what area you you know put as your definition, is is you know something that we discussed and debated several years ago when this was implemented and we went with 10,000 square feet. Um, the concern is that 10,000 square feet uh, retail floor area um, in, a, in some situations might still be more of a convenience store than a, two grocery, than a true grocery store. So the suggestion was to increase it to 15,000 square feet. We're not really seeing what you would typically consider a true grocery store to go in uh, you know, new establishments at less than 15,000 square feet. Usually right. they're significantly more than that, but even the smaller ones have been 15 to 20,000 square feet. Well, just um, as an example, like uh, the new Aldi's, how many square feet is that versus the old Dunkles or Byron High V, how many square feet is that versus the new Frugal Finds on um, uh, down there on East or West 5th um do we do you have square footage on those as a comparison i i don't have the numbers of specific sites we could certainly look into that 
Um, of course, any site that's not in an overlay district, the um, size of a grocery store wouldn't be relevant. They could be a 5,000 square foot grocery store outside of an overlay district. Right. It's only mm -hmm. going to be if they're in an overlay district where it's going to affect them. And then the other thing is any existing one that sells alcohol. I'm not sure if all the ones you're just mentioning are establishments that sell alcohol or not, but mm -hmm. any existing one that sells alcohol and is in an overlay district, if it's um, currently over 10,000 square feet, but under 15,000 square feet, it would become grandfathered in. Could, uh, Madam Chairperson, um, could we get a um, listing of comparisons between different places, like the three that I mentioned, plus maybe some place like, like Ray's out on, uh, what is that, Nevada Street, Nevada and Franklin? I believe yeah raises is that raise i know yep. yeah yep. yeah we can okay. put that together okay thank you okay any other questions mr amos okay thank motion. you mr sheridan motion to adjourn second 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 all in favor say aye aye, aye. opposed we are adjourned
and welcome to the Waterloo City Council Finance Committee. Ask our city clerk for roll call, please. Mr. Jacobs? Here. Mr. Morrissey? Here. Mrs. Jewin? Here. Motion to approve the agenda and the minutes of July 30th, 2018 is proposed. Second. Discussion? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same. Okay. Would someone take the travel request, please? Madam Chairperson, we have two travel requests today. Captain Dave Mullis to attend the Law Enforcement Leadership Series Conference in Ames, Iowa, September 10th through 11th, not to exceed $363. Michelle Wiener, Chief Financial Officer, to a Officer to attend the League of Cities Annual Conference in Council Bluffs, Iowa, September 12th to the 14th, Mount not to exceed $285. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we have a long list of pre authorizations for expenditures over a thousand. So I'm going to ask one person to take one through nine and the second to take. 10 through 18. I can take all of them, Madam Chairperson. Take them all? Yes, I have a voice this evening. <laughs> okay, so, um, you've got the endurance. So uh, I would like to make a motion to approve the following pre authorization expend over $1,000. Um, number three is uh, far from the fire department, amount estimated shipping and handling of $1,400 plus $15.51 shipping and handling for seven barrier hoods and 11 sets of structural firefighting gloves. Next is from the fire department with the mountain estimated shipping handling is $79.95 with expenditure uh, for ESO suit or suite subscription uh, from 9118 through 83119. Next is the fire department with mountain estimated shipping handling not to exceed $25,000 for repairs and maintenance to truck 311. Next is from the fire department with the amount of estimated shipping and handling not to exceed $8,500 for department uniforms. Next is from the finance department with the amount of estimated shipping and handling of $88,624 for annual maintenance fees for financial community development and code enforcement software. Next is the finance department with the amount of estimated shipping and handling not to exceed $5,000 for arbitrage rebate services for bond issues. Next is the finance department with the amount of estimated shipping and handling of 15000 for consulting services. Next is the garage so that's with the amount of estimated shipping and handling of $36,828 for one cent of sterile Coney mobile vehicle lifts. Next is for Mayor Quentin Hart with the amount of estimated shipping and handling of $5,269 for the yearly membership dues for the United States Conference of Mayors. Next is the police department with Mountain Estimated Shipping and Handling of $20,000 plus $500 shipping and handling for hardware software for utilization of forensic cell phone examination. Next is the sewer department with the Mountain Estimated Shipping and Handling of $10,700 plus $2,300 shipping and handling for rental of two six inch hydraulic submersible pumps and two diesel powered hydraulic power packs for a period of up to five weeks with rental protection plan. Next is sewer department with mountain estimated shipping handling of $7,100 for reconditioned motor with bearing replacement and labor. Next is the sewer department with the mountain estimated shipping handling of $2,900 plus $510 shipping and handling for the CAT2 catalytic carbon for H2S odor control at Park Road lift station. Next is the sewer department, Mountain Estimated Shipping Handling of $3,670.44 plus $35.42 shipping and handling for replacement of two gear motors, parts, and labor for TV camera tractor. Next is the traffic department, Mountain Estimated Shipping Handling of $1,333.10 for EC blue and black film transfer tape, 12 inch by 18 inch and 18 inch by 18 inch sign blanks. And last in 18 is the traffic department for Mountain Estimated Shipping and Handling, $4,300 for 250 HIP 24 inch by 24 inch no parking signs. Good job. Second. Marcy. Second. Discussion? Madam oh. Chairperson, excuse yes. me, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Chairperson, just number seven, um, I guess I wasn't aware that our. Um, our software, our annual fees for our software for is eighty eight thousand six hundred twenty four. It just seems like a large amount of money for software. 
Does anyone want to address that? Michelle Weidner, Chief Financial Officer. Well, this is software that's used by all departments and for a number of different functions. This is um, approximately the similar amount that's been paid in prior years. So it is the annual support fee to use it. Thank you. Yes, Madam Chairperson. Can, and I know the mayor's not here, but can somebody tell me item number 11? I know that's a fairly new group that uh, he has chosen to become involved with. Can somebody tell me what the city gets for that? Does anyone want to address that, Ms. Weidner? Michelle Weidner, Chief Financial Officer. Again, I'm not sure that I can tell you everything, but I can tell you we got a $100,000 grant award to our city. That's probably the biggest financial impact. So I think he's attended conferences and has gotten a lot of ideas about um, new ways to do things and networking with other mayors of cities in similar circumstances also. So the city got $100,000? Um, it was awarded to the city. We did pass it through to an city. entity. Yeah, taxpayers didn't get a dime. Taxpayers didn't get a dime. When it came to the city, we made that choice to pass it along to them. Other questions? If not, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed the same? Okay, ask for a motion for the other committee business, please. Madam Chairperson, we have four items for other committee business tonight. We have a, a refund request in the amount of $139.50 for garbage fees bill and error on a vacant duplex located at 827 and 829 East Ridgeway. We have a refund request in the amount of $22.80 for garbage fees bill and error on a vacant property located at 554 Adrian. Refund request amount of $315 for garbage fees bill and error on a vacant property located at 823 Progress Avenue. And lastly, a refund request in the amount of $346.85 for garbage fees billed in air on a vacant property located at 321 Euclid Avenue. Second. Discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Under bills payment, we have the amount of $3,183.927.50. As in the accounts payable report dated August 6, 2018, move to receive, place on file, and forward to the full council. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion Terrific. to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>